My name is Ben McLeish. I'm um, Advocacy and Engagement for Digital Science at Altmetric. And today I'm going to take you through a few of the points, just a very few of the points, because we have something like half an hour plus, probably plus questions, um, on how to track, perhaps evaluate, compare, and keep on top of and discover the attention to research that happens across the web, um, whether it is to research that comes from you as a researcher or whether it is to broadly your institution. Uh, these are things that the Altmetric Explorer can do. And to sort of um, cover this topic, which will necessarily leave out uh, quite a lot of additional finer detail, I thought I would quickly uh, initiate anybody who's not been to an Altmetric webinar before, who has not used the service, perhaps never heard of it, uh, initiate them into what we track, what we actually look for, and how we do it. A spoiler alert, sadly, we don't use magic, although it does sometimes seem like we must. Um, then I'm just going to underline quickly how immediate some of the altmetric data is. Um, some of these um, metrics out there uh, in the scientific landscape, in the research landscape, in the publishing landscape are quite slow. They have to be slow because the process of writing a paper to, to include a citation to something which then is picked up as a citation metric for another paper is of course going to move at the pace of the publishing process and the authorship process. But when it comes to reactions, um, attention online, those can be seconds or minutes in the making. And it is always worth underlining this. Um, you can try it yourself, um, and I will certainly try it for a random institution as well. Um, then I'm gonna show some of the tools we offer uh, in the way of building profiles of that research attention for researchers themselves. Um, and that could be one researcher, it could be a group of researchers that have been handpicked. So you perhaps want five or six researchers that happen to be working on a project at the moment, or indeed it may be to a full department. And I will show how we do that as well. And as I've underlined there as well, or rather put in parentheses, we do not make the researchers do this. Um, they are curating enough uh, online uh, platforms of their publications. They don't want to do yet another one um, for something they perhaps are not yet familiar with. Um, then I will show some of the ways in which you can support those researchers at an institutional level by alerting them to high value kinds of attention. Um, interestingly, the, the attention uh, types that we consider to have highest value coming from things like uh, intergovernmental policy documents that have reused or cited a piece of work from a researcher or a patent that has used a publication as a citation somewhere are exactly those that are also hardest to find by hand. Uh, they're actually ones that sometimes people don't realize were even a source of attention for research to begin with. Um, and then uh, I will very quickly um, show how you can not only see your entire institution, no matter which flavor of what metric you have with us uh, in license, you can see either an exact copy of what you have in your current research information system or your repository, uh, or you can see a general guess, uh, sort of a high confidence affiliation uh, work that digital science has done so that you can see where we have detected that something does come from the University of Bremen or the University of Southampton. And so you can either look at that as your data set or you can actually look and benchmark against any other data set out there. So you can go and have a look at how's Oxford or Cambridge University's attention doing um, really anybody out of tens of thousands of institutions worldwide. So that's sort of the general thread that we'll be walking through. So a quick refresher then. Altmetric tracks attention to research. The research papers themselves are things that are linked to in news, within blogs, uh, they are posted on Twitter and so forth. They are not found by keywords. We don't look for a title of a paper uh, as the identifier. We look for something that has a DOI, that has an ISBN, that has an SSRN, that has a PubMed ID. Um, in fact, I've got a whole list of them that I'll, I'll just show you in a minute. Um, so as long as it has a persistent identifier, and it is mentioned somewhere where we are listening out for um, research to be mentioned, whether that's all of Twitter or whether it's the thousands of news sources that we look for uh, across the world in, I think, 43, 44 different languages at the moment, um, whether it's on blogs or, or in, within policy sources that we have data mined for these kinds of data, that is what we will find. So by research output or publication we don't just mean articles although of course they are the dominant source of publications because they are the dominant type of publications out there at the moment 
Um, there are millions and millions of them, and there are, of course, far fewer books. Um, I think there are 50 million books in total that the uh, humanity has authored. Uh, over the many years. I think it might be slightly more now. But we will track really anything that has an identifier. So for example, in the image above there, there is a video data set that has been hosted on Figshare, um, which is where research data sets live uh, outside of an article, places where they can be cited as the content itself. Um, even if it didn't make it into an article, it is still a valuable output from a research process. It has been visualized automatically. Uh, and it's been given, as you can see there, a lovely digital object identifier. That's the kind of thing that Altmetric automatically listens out for. Uh, those data sets could be on Zenodo, they could be on Dryad, they could be on Pangea. Uh, if, as long as they have an identifier like that, uh, we, when uh, somebody posts a tweet or it gets shared in the news or it gets cited somewhere else, we will pick that up automatically because we recognize that form of a link and we know that that must lead to something that people consider to be research and we then follow it back and identify it and add that attention to what we call an article details page that collects all of the different types of attention that a piece of research has received. And we'll have a look at one of those in just a moment. There is that list of identifiers. So like I say, there's something like one, two, three, four, five, six, twelve, 12, what, 13 sort of. Um, there are 12 um, uh, in, in reality. Uh, ORCID isn't actually a type of thing we follow deliberately. We're not picking up where somebody mentions an ORCID, for example, an author identifier, but we will be able to, within our Altmetric service, query the ORCID database and say, I've got this following ORCID um, and I would like to have the publications that are associated with it sent back to me, please. And then within the Altmetric service, you then see the attention to the research that, that ORCID or rather that author has received. Um, and then there is a custom link there at the bottom as well. The URLs, uh, we can sometimes, depending on the quality of a customer's website, we can treat their blog entries, their image posts, their updates, their press releases uh, as outputs in themselves, as if they were an article, as if they were a publication, which of course they are a publication, they're just not an academic one or a research one. Um, but if they have the right metadata, we can treat their whole website as if it were a journal, so to speak. And when, every, when anybody uh, would share one of those blogs, let's say, uh, then we will pick up that attention and be able to gauge it in exactly the same way as we can uh, gauge everything else. Uh, we have something like 17 different sources of uh, attention these days, uh, policy, news, blogs, Twitter, I've uh, already mentioned. There are some retired ones. So for example, Sina Weibo, uh, the Chinese version of Twitter, we have historical data for up to 20, mid-2015, mid I think it is. Um, same thing with Pinterest and LinkedIn that all deprecated around the same time. We've held on to the historical data, but they became unfortunately technically impossible to track after that time. Uh, and Google Plus died a death back in April as well. So we've got the old stuff for Google Plus as well. Rest assured, however, it was not setting the academic world on fire. It's one of the reasons why it was retired. It wasn't setting much on fire, actually, but there was some stuff there. And where there was that data, we did keep it. I should say where there were those data, we, we did keep it. Um, things that we've added fairly recently, uh, patent data. So when patents refer to a publication, that was something we added, if memory serves correctly, this year, uh, I believe in March or April. And there are a good 10 million references to citations within uh, the patent data that we have mined so far. So it's a good data source, actually. It shows a, a, an interesting link between what you publish and what someone else invents. We do have some citation data as well, as much as we do differentiate ourselves from the more established metrics like citations, we can plug into uh, Web of Science. That means that uh, mutual customers of ours will see an extra tab on that dimension, uh, sorry, on the altmetric details page that shows um, the most recent three academic citations where a paper has referred to this paper. And then we have also even for people who are not mutual customers. Uh, we have uh, dropped the data, the citations that Dimensions has teased out of the academic literature into uh, every page as well. Those are downloadable, you can, you can export them, you can report on them. You don't have to have a Dimensions license for that to happen. Uh, we have a visualization that you will see uh, that broadly shows by color um, how many sources have interacted with your uh, uh, publication. Green is YouTube, for example. So if there are YouTube videos out there that link to research within their description pages, then we pick that up. 
I think we follow something like 70,000 different uh, YouTube channels at the moment um, and are adding more all the time, but we follow the ones that quite deliberately and very famously do uh, share research. Um, news sources are red, just think of the BBC, I suppose the header of the BBC is always red. Uh, purple is policy and so forth. Gives you a very quick um, idea about whether this has gone viral, as the kids like to say, or whether it is uh, uniformly within a certain area. So if it was all only on Twitter, for example, if you're only gathering tweets for your attention, it would all, this, this um, donut, uh, so to speak, would be all that light blue trademark Twitter color that there is. And then the score is to give you an idea of the volume of attention. It is not there to give you an idea of quality. Um, high numbers do not mean good quality, and that is actually true of almost every metric out there. High numbers of citations hmm, correlates with good quality, I guess, but uh, at the same time, you can also have a retracted article with you know, 1,000 to 2,000 citations as well. So it is here simply to give you an idea. Yes, there are lots of voices talking. They are perhaps talking in high volume and high value places, like if you get a news mention, that is worth something like eight points, whereas a tweet is worth only one. It is brief it links somewhere else it contains by necessity and by design much less content anybody can do it the barrier to entry is so low that even a bot or many bots can be sharing your data it's not even a real person but nevertheless uh, it is still to be counted uh, it's just not to be counted the same way as news and so forth so it's there just to, get, to put things in some kind of order for you so how immediate are these data um, well, uh, it's down to uh, the minute sometimes. Um, I did have a conversation once on Twitter with um, a researcher who works on, um, uh, what does he do? He um, he studies alt metrics and so the, the general field uh, of research metrics uh, for general the, the general public's engagement with it. And he looks at it on sort of BRICS nations and developing nations and tries to come up with a model that would sort of um, balance that a little bit. You know, Twitter isn't massive all over the world. It is very much a, a global north, global west kind of thing. Um, but so he, he works on that. And I think at, at some point during our Twitter conversation, I shared an item and it was tracked on a, all, all, the old metric details page within, a, I think, three or four minutes. In our Explorer, which is the web interface we'll jump into in a moment, uh, we refresh all of the data once uh, every midnight uh, GMT. So uh, midnight uh, UK time um, is when we refresh all of the prior day's data. So it is essentially up to the previous night, but it is quite uh, fascinating. This is a screenshot I took um, just now, about two hours ago, um, for uh, the most recent news highlights and just the latest mentions at all uh, for data coming from the University of Göttingen in Germany. Uh, you would see this uh, for any institution you care to look up in our database or indeed for the full database if you just want to see the aggregate attention uh, overall. I'm just quickly making sure um, okay some people be are having issues with the audio I will watch out and make sure it's not my fault uh, but we are recording so I'm hoping it'll be intermittent um, and won't disturb you too much um, if anyone else is having those problems do let me know so um, you can also not just see the most recent attention that has uh, shown up uh, you can see the most recent attention for your full institution up to that previous night as well um, we have done some work at um, Altmetric to um, add affiliations in over the last uh, few uh, months. So previously, it was the case that um, customers of ours would get the full database view. They would see simply all attention we have ever found to anything that can be described as research. And then we would custom implement them. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, where we would simply mirror back to them a copy of their repository or a copy of their uh, current research information system, or in some cases where they didn't have either of those systems, they perhaps had an Excel spreadsheet of the author names, the publication identifiers belonging to those authors, and then the departments that they belong to. And so you would then be able to see what you consider to be your data or all data. And we've now changed that so that you can, and I'll, I'll now jump away from uh, these um, lovely slides. Who doesn't love slides? Um, we have now designed it so that when you come to 
the Explorer, at the moment we are looking at everything in the full database. You'll see here's the front page. We have something like 100 and, almost 112 million mentions of data overall. You can see the items that have been mentioned the most. You can see the, the uh, accounts or the, the, the mention sources that are most commonly uh, talking about research. So these are large policy organizations. There is a Twitter account called Black Physicists that's uh, regularly sharing data, probably from archive and other physics conversations. Um, you can see the top journals, the top affiliations, the top subject areas uh, of uh, these publications as they are uh, talked about. So Harvard University is spoken about the most in terms of its research. Of course, people don't say the word Harvard University when they are sharing an item. It's normally part of an argument if it's on Twitter or a news story if it's uh, on the news. Uh, you can see the latest items. So for example, we picked up a tweet 14 hours ago, which of course is right uh, before midnight because um, uh, we're looking at UTC there. Um, so did I get that right? No, uh, one, one o'clock, sorry, uh, one o'clock here UTC. So um, we do have a, a fair amount of data pouring through all the time. And then you can see sort of where it comes from in the world. Um, and that's all well and good. But the thing that um, institutions really want to be able to see is, well, what about my things? I mean, when I talk about, as I did yesterday, when I talk about Altmetric to anybody who works at an institution, if they're a researcher, the first question they're gonna ask is, oh, can I see my stuff? And we can indeed do that, um, not uh, out of the box at an author level, but if you can get either their ORCID, uh, you can do it, uh, or if you want to just simply show them their own data uh, from their own uh, institution, I'll do Göttingen University again. Um, our smart search will do multiple searches at once. So it'll say, do you want to look for the words Göttingen University in the publication title? It's probably not gonna be a very good search um, uh, or whether it's just the keywords or, or whether there are certain publishers, so Göttingen University Press, for example, uh, or the names of journals, funder names. We do have funder data in there as well. So we can tell you um, the attention that publications that have been funded by a certain funder have received. But if I then just simply want to go and have a look at Göttingen University, I can then go and see the aggregate attention to this institution. Uh, here is our footprint. Um, if we are now at Göttingen University, I'm now working there, let's say. Um, I can now see everything that the, the social web and the interactive web, the discussion web has um, shared uh, our data to, where, where it has gone, what sources it comes from, who are our friends, I suppose, on Twitter, who are the people who are talking about our data the most, what are the top outputs and where have they uh, been mentioned. Um, I'll click on one of these just so we can explore the details page itself because these data are sort of where you start to be able to support your researchers a little bit because they will not have seen any of this before. They will be spending a long time uh, doing their research, but they won't necessarily realize the uh, audience to their research uh, that uh, they are gathering. So we can see very quickly the uh, demographics, whether that's by Twitter or whether it's by Mendeley. This example, uh, unfortunately, does have some data, but no one specified where they're from. So we can see that they are uh, in engaging with other parts of the discipline or the academic community. We can make some sense of this level of attention uh, of items, comparing it, for example, you know, is this normal attention? Is this unusual? Um, has Have I received more of an audience than I would have expected to um, compared to other items that are also published in the same journal or of a similar age or combo of those two things? Or how does this item actually rank roughly in comparison with the sort of the volume of attention that other items have received? Um, you can see, of course, the individual um, uh, sources of where these um, stories have come from or the attention on the social web, for example. Uh, so we can see when uh, it happened. This one, which is I think a fairly old article, is still being discussed in 2019. And very importantly, I think the bit that is going to be most interesting for a lot of researchers is things like where policy documents themselves, like in this case, the World Economic Forum, have ended up speaking about um, uh, these uh, publications. Uh, they've used them as citations within PDFs that sit online in large archives that are for specialists and uh, where they, they tackle very complex issues. And uh, you could just download the PDF and read it through and then find where we have cited, where we've found the citation. It's actually quite interesting to do that because it'll show you how we, in the case of policy and sometimes in the case of news, we are looking for um, 
citations even if they don't have digital object identifiers so because we are downloading and then data mining uh, the pdfs of a policy organization it does allow us to look for a possible journal name and compare that to a large list of journal names out there including abbre abbreviations and other things like that um, we are looking for an author name we're looking for a date um, we're looking for um, you know, a, a title, maybe a volume and issue, and that is enough to then reverse engineer back to, well, what was the digital object identifier for that? Is there one result if we ping the Crossref API? If we go and ask them, if I gave you this title, this uh, journal, uh, these dates, um, and what looks like this title, is there one result? And if there is, then we know, ah, we found the item that they're talking about. Let me just quickly... There we go. Okay, good. I'm just making sure that people aren't having issues. So um, a point I wanted to make about um, how to make this useful for uh, researchers. Uh, the first one is there is a, a small uh, publishing tactic actually out here. So this is sort of the highlights tab, right? Here you can see the all the different publications that have come out. And then you have a timeline, a full timeline from beginning to end of the when the publication attention happened. Now it looks really strange because there's this long long tail that precedes the internet from this point and then but there are these sort of small mentions. There really are old mentions from the 1940s and 50s within policy. We have uh, indexed very old documents that cited academic literature that has now received a digital footprint in the form of an identifier. So those are real, they, they are there, but you can sort of have a look at uh, the trend by dragging it across like this down to the point where it'll eventually go into uh, individual days. Now, as an institution, that's kind of interesting because you can see the general trend of uh, whether your attention is going up or whether it's going down or whether it's staying the same. If you want to curate a larger online audience, if you want to make more efforts with your PR and communications team, they will also not have seen these data before because they will be invested in media monitoring services which are looking for keywords, they will be sending press releases out and trying to get into specific publications, but the organic attention that research receives when no one is talking about your institutional name, they might not be mentioning your authors, they may even use a bunch of words to describe the research that are not the ones you would have expected. Uh, but we will still find it if they're linking to it. Uh, and we know it's yours because it's either in your profile or we have done the affiliation matching uh, to add it to, in this case, the University of Göttingen. University of Göttingen, by the way, is not a customer, uh, despite my best efforts. Um, they uh, are um, collaborators of ours in the Altmetrics space in terms of uh, we um, do many presentations with them to the German community about the space in general, but they've never been a customer, they've never worked on our data for us. This is what digital science has managed to do quite absent uh, the support of um, any of the institutions out there. This is something that is uh, automatic. But if you were to go uh, away from the University of Göttingen, go back to the full attention to the um, Explorer. So this is everything that there has ever been uh, mentioned uh, outside of a specific institution. There is an interesting thing that popped up a couple of years ago. You see it on a certain level. It's when I bring it down, there it is. So th this is what, 29th of April of this year, all the way through to yesterday. Right, it would have been the 2nd of October, yes, Gandhi's birthday. I know that because we were in London and saw his statue being visited by many people. There are these weird gaps, and those are the weekend. That is always Saturday, and the lower one is always Sunday. It's quite remarkable, isn't it, that on the weekend when people have their most free time, they actually engage with research a lot less. Now, one simple tip to the PR and the communications team or to researchers themselves is don't um, send a press release out about your research that you've just published or that you want to make widely available, don't do it on a Friday or even maybe a Thursday because you will lose something like a third of your audience for two days in a row after that. So very basic publication strategies looking at trends would be uh, to make sure that you institute a form of, you know, making a big sound and fury about it on a Monday, preferably after everyone's had their coffee or maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, that appears um, to um, really be the case as, as it goes up and down. It doesn't matter 
when I've looked at these data, it's been this way for five years, which means that it consistently keeps happening week to week. So you can already advise your researchers and their, their communications officers about that very simple truth. People do, actually don't share more on a weekend. Uh, they might share more cat videos, but when it comes to research itself, it seems that all sources, whether it's social, whether it's um, news publications, uh, th those tend to follow um, the, the week to weekend pattern. Um, so that's the first one. Now, when it comes to um, a researcher, they will then say, well, what about my stuff? And so we built the a mechanism for creating researcher profiles. Now, researchers have curated, as I write here, LinkedIn profiles, Google Scholar, academia.edu, uh, ResearchGate. They are populating your internal uh, systems. They probably love absolutely every single moment of all of that. And so we decided, A, that it's very important that we don't ask them to do it yet again. And B, that we cur actually curate something different than what they're curating. Researchers are spending a long time describing their work, their publications, their things, but they can't describe their audience. They can't curate their audience in the same way. That's what we decided to do. They've not seen these data before and they have not got, really got the tools to do it either. It would take essentially a lot of um, database work uh, to do it. Um, and so we've uh, found that when we uh, plugged into a, a CRIS, a current research information system, uh, or into um, a, like I say, either a spreadsheet or the um, repository that an institution already has at their disposal, where they, the work has already been done, then we can do what I just did. I can go to my institution, I can select uh, my uh, profile, or perhaps I'm over in the Ks, I could be Michael Caine, Clark Kent, or James T. Kirk, he's only got 180, we'll do that. Uh, and I can then see my publications. I haven't had to do any work as a researcher to uh, see this. And I can then either use these data to network with new researchers or maybe um, pitch my work to new audiences that I didn't know were actually interacting with my work. Could be that there's a patient group of 100,000 people out there and I happen to publish uh, in the uh, disease area that that research group is interested in or as, as posted about before. I could join that group. Um, I could um, act as a form of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, affiliated, uh, almost expert that would come and, and uh, post uh, things there as well. Um, or you can understand some of the common misconceptions that an audience might have. Or I could decide that I want to simply export these data and use them in my grant application. Because increasingly, uh, and it has been the case for quite a while in the UK, it's becoming more the case now as well in Europe, especially with the end of things like Horizon 2020, um, there is a whole um, section on impact. Um, used to be called, um, used to be considered the blah, blah, blah section, as, as one of the um, speakers once said, uh, Horizon 2020 expert. That is now a critical section that will mean uh, the difference between a pass and a fail when it comes to um, a, a successful grant application and a successful um, uh, uh, sort of finalized report about how the research funding has been spent. Have you reached the wider community outside of academia? Because even though there may still be a little bit of an ivory tower effect with academia, funders, governments, um, and large uh, sort of uh, organizations that are interested in the sort of the broader applications of, of research have by now fully agreed that it is extremely important um, that we reach the general public, that public education about science, citizen science, all that stuff, all those buzzwords that people uh, talk about, those are really important and need to be uh, demonstrated. Um, and so this researcher, if I am indeed Jim T. Kirk, I could either download that and uh, receive it as an Excel spreadsheet. It's very, very simple. I can just hit that button. Uh, and I can then uh, see the different counts, or I could even go and get the individual uh, tweet links and the individual news stories and when they happened and what it was about uh, and, and all of that. Um, or I could be more proactive in the future. Um, I can actually save my search. I can, I can save this as a, a view of the data that I want to revisit. And that saved search will live there. And from now on, I can say that every morning, I would like to have an email with the new attention to any of the research in the Explorer that is under my name, that has come through the repository, through the current research information system, um, and it sits in our profile. I want to know when my audience is talking to me about that. Um, and 
I can get that as a daily email. I can get it instantly as well. I can just simply send that email to myself. It is super fun to press that button. We have had people just pressing it over and over again before. Um, I will have like three or four emails in my inbox now right about this. Um, so I can actually begin to actively monitor, you know, what is my audience getting up to online? What are they talking about? When does it happen after publication? Does it happen immediately? Does it happen a little bit later down the road? Is it a slow burn effect over many months? This is all worth knowing about. Um, it is also worth knowing about where the attention is most prominent. So you can, for example, see that very same timeline about just my publications. It'll look, of course, a lot different, a lot smaller than a full institution, but you can start to get a good sense of the high value areas. So for example, James T. Kirk, as is probably not surprising, has been in several policy documents. Uh, these uh, pieces of his research um, do exist out in these different places. I can see which ones they are. There, here's one, for example, where that one does belong to the, the profile themselves, and this is just a further one. There are, in fact, 487 further publications in this policy document from uh, the NICE clinical uh, guidelines. Uh, there's mine, and I can see the, uh, the type of attention, the level of attention, and I can then compare it to the others as well. And you will see as you go further down the list that they begin to only be mentioned by policy. Some of the items have actually never been mentioned anywhere except within policy documents. There is... Uh, many examples of where they've only appeared there. And lastly, I could go and have a look at, well, where do I publish? Um, I publish a lot in uh, a lot of different places. I publish uh, in terms of total mentions. When I publish in environmental health perspectives, that seems to be my biggest audience. Might it be worth um, also publishing there again? Uh, or might it be worth, if I want to reach policymakers, what is it they're reading? They are also reading the same item, but environmental health and pediatrics have also received some decent policy mentions as well. So it gives your researchers an idea about, they will already know a good idea about what to read, but it's a good way of discovering new uh, types of uh, research to read. If they're interested in the policy audience side of things, they want to read what the policymakers are, are reading as well, or where to publish um, and uh, other sort of strategies around that. We do also have some demographics. So in addition to Twitter, you will get also things like Facebook demographics. These are just for pages, we don't track people. Um, so this is where pages have posted items. Um, there are, of course, the news policy, uh, sorry, the news and policy uh, demographics as well. So where are the news organizations coming from that have shared my publications, have used them uh, in their area? Uh, same thing for policy as well. Um, so we can see the some US ones, some UK ones, Australian ones. I can click on these as well. These are uh, all interactive. So I can very, very quickly find um, you know, what has Australian policy said about, uh, you know, what have they been publishing, which relied a little bit on uh, what my publication was. You can do this with more than one author as well. Um, this is something uh, I, I did mention at the beginning. There is the ability uh, when you're implemented, when your institution has a license for all metric to add uh, multiple uh, other institutional um, authors as well. These are people who have also existed in the data that come from that institution. So for example, we can add uh, Clarkson Kent, I can't remember. Yep, there is a Penelope Shadow Smith as well as cool names. If I want to save those and I want to uh, therefore support that uh, group of authors, I can also save uh, that as a view as well. Um, so I now have those att the attention for those four authors, their publications all in one. Again, I can save that. I'm now uh, able, whether I'm in the library or the research office, to um, support uh, those uh, authors, that group of authors who happen to be working on something, here is a essentially a stream of attention uh, of their combined work. It may not be work where all of them are on the same paper. These are their combined outputs, which is why we ended up with uh, 1,459 uh, items that have attention, because they, they were roughly at sort of 180, 190 publications for our pretend institution here. This is, of course, Lilliput University, a, a made-up institution that simply showcases how it works. So uh, without any work, really, uh, the researchers can get a good sense of uh, what is going on there. And that's quite important, actually, because uh, it can sometimes happen that negative attention shows up. And those authors would like to surely know about that um, before it's too late. 
There have been stories of people who have been accused of image manipulation on places like Publons and PubPeer, which of course are post-publication peer review websites. And they will um, sometimes positively review a publication, sometimes negatively. And it can sometimes be weeks and weeks before the author actually gets wind accidentally, usually from a colleague, that there is some sort of complaint online justified or not. And so another thing that I would really like to see institutions do, and I think I haven't really seen anyone do yet, um, is to institute a, almost a level of horizon scanning when it comes to the kinds of attention that are out there, so that um, authors can get a good sense very quickly of if, if there's anything unusual uh, being talked about um, about them or about their research, again, justified or not. Finally, very quickly, what are my uh, competing institutions getting up to? I would like to know, if I'm Oxford uh, University, I would like to know uh, how is Cambridge University doing? How do we compare against them? I'm going to filter away from our pretend institution and our pretend verified authors to just the full database in order to then ask it, uh, what have people said about research that come from Cambridge University? Um, or rather the University of Cambridge, as our system will correct me. Um, this is something that we are seeing for the United Kingdom Research Excellence Framework. Um, people are comparing themselves in terms of citations, funding, um, the whole unit of assessment um, work. Uh, they are, they are um, putting forward their best research, they are providing uh, value statements and impact um, uh, work about them, they're, they're presenting the underpinning research, which usually comes from the prior ref. Um, in uh, the United States, the uh, National Science Foundation also requests broader dissemination of research. Uh, it's right on their website. Um, there are several uh, organizations on the mainland Europe that are doing the same thing. And so part of that might be that you can state that you are amongst your immediate peers as an institution, broadly in line with what one would expect uh, from the level of attention that you are higher and that, some, uh, that, that may demonstrate that uh, your uh, research is easily shared, that it's being made available, that the conversations are in fact happening. Um, and you could uh, do some things like, for example, have a look at uh, where the attention is showing up. So the University of Cambridge, for example, would be uh, very happy to know, and um, indeed being a customer are happy to know that they have something like 7,000 uh, references uh, within policy documents uh, out there, that there are 44,000 patents uh, that are uh, mentioning their research, and that that trend is uniquely and heavily unambiguously going up. Uh, that they're, they're, uh, even their older scholarly works are being used uh, within patent applications and then successful patent literature uh, out there. Sorry, I've still got it written on Australia. I'll uh, get rid of that. Uh, and I, I've also, there we go. Um, so a good way of um, allowing your researchers to answer these kinds of questions. Where is my data used? Is anybody actually inventing anything? Um, is anybody in the uh, policy space uh, using our research? And what was the context? I can get straight to that PDF without trying to Google it. Googling this stuff doesn't work. Um, it's, it, it doesn't show up the same way. Your, your author's name is not a useful keyword for finding where their research has been used. Is probably the clearest way I can say that. Um, and so with that, that is sort of roughly half an hour, a little bit longer, actually, I must admit. Uh, I will um, move to a better view where not just the University of Cambridge is there, uh, but where we can see all the data again. And I will happily invite um, any questions out there. I had one already. Somebody said, is the Altmetric Explorer free? There are versions of it that are. Uh, there is a version of the Altmetric Explorer that is free for librarians. Uh, that has uh, all the data, but it has some limited functionality. Um, but it is very popular with our librarian community. So if you are interested, uh, please do drop us a line at support at altmetric.com. You could write to me if you like at, uh, I've got it right over here actually, uh, ben at altmetric.com and we'll happily evaluate um, whether you're in the library space and uh, do that. For the more advanced uh, Altmetric Explorer for institutions, that is an annual license um, uh, for uh, on, a, on an institutional level actually. We tend to make it available to any and all people from a university or an institution. 
uh, is unlimited with the number of users, uh, the number of uses, uh, the number of downloads of data, for example. Um, all new features that we deliver tend to be uh, part of that um, uh, same license, so there's no sort of modules you have to purchase on top of things. It is a very straightforward um, annual license. So um, free in some cases. There are also some free tools on our website, actually. Um, so if I minimize very quickly, uh, you will find on altmetric.com there are some free tools. Uh, so uh, there are there is a, a bookmarklet, which I haven't used for a while, actually. It might be fun to do that now free tools down here uh, there's the bookmarklet but there are some some free tools uh, which you can happily neg uh, navigate to the bookmarklet is actually mentioned on here too uh, you can if you have a repository at your institution you can put our altmetric badges on there for free as well that actually looks pretty good and it's one i suppose actually one of the best bits about the system um, is that here, for example, is a non-customer of ours. I tend to only show non-customers, actually, just to demonstrate that there are quite a lot of uh, free tools. So they have actually helped themselves to the dimensions and the altmetric badges. These are both digital science products, both free. They're both, um, the University of Zurich is not a customer of either of them. Uh, but you can drop these in very, very easily onto your page as well. They they are clickable. They, are, they will behave differently. Uh, there is a super easy... Um, piece of code on uh, api.altmetric.com. This is our embeddable badges. It's also linked from the free tools section, so you don't have to hastily scribble it down, but it'll tell you exactly how to produce those two lines of code. There's even a, a, a code builder. So I want a small donut, for example, or a, a medium bar, so it doesn't quite look the same, uh, or I would like to have a large badge, uh, one that has the score with perhaps a pop out, and I want that pop out to go on the right or maybe the left, right? Or all of those things. When it's got no mentions, please don't show anything. You can do those kinds of things too. And it's that code that you then drop into your uh, structure of your repository and will then put that badge next to any publication on that repository that has some attention. So do feel free to use that as well. It is being used by hundreds of repositories around the world. We have lost track of how many there are because <laughs> we don't um, uh, we don't automatically know about it uh, when people use those badges because um, institutional repositories that offer open access data, they are invited quite freely to just help themselves to the code. So that is uh, free as well. Um, and they will also click where did I go I was did I go the wrong place yeah I went from uh, that's right I went from here so um, you can then also click these data and you will then be given that um, details page that we were on before as well so the University of Zurich don't just see a number and a list of, of mentions they do they do see each individual um, item and uh, Yep, they'll even see where they were recommended, for example, on Faculty of a Thousand. So that's entirely free as well. There are more questions, I believe. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, okay, let's make sure I get through these. Uh, what other types of institutions can you collect data on? All your examples were universities. That is a great question. And that is actually, so I'll just repeat that because I read that quite quickly, sorry. Um, so what other institutions do we have data for rather than just universities? It is true that I was only searching uh, universities just now. Um, the affiliations themselves come from a separate system we built called GRID. And GRID is a very, very large, completely free uh, CC0 database of the world's research-based institutions. Those include, for example, corporates. So every single Pfizer, for example, if they have a website, if they have what's called, um, uh, they can be defined as an each individual entity. Uh, any of these would show up in the Altmetric Explorer, provided that they also have um, publications. Um, it could be that they exist, but they have actually never shown up uh, on a paper that has also received attention. You could also find um, the governments of the world. In fact, you don't need to search the word government. You can actually just ask for government as a type. Um, so any of the governmental organizations would show up there as well. Uh, any facility, any archive, any uh, healthcare uh, company. Uh, there are others as well. There are ones that don't fit easily into that. So for example, uh, you know, the German Society of Surgery, it's, it's partly a, a, a society, partly uh, a publisher of, uh, of, of items. It sort of sits in the sort of the middle. There is a huge uh, amount of data out there, actually. There are something like 
let's have a look, we had it, 97,000 almost, 96,793 different institutes. Uh, and they will show up if I just start typing. Um, so for example, I could type National Institutes of Health, and it will do that sort of uh, query for me. And interestingly, it will search for the NIH either as an affiliation, in other words, they have been on the paper themselves, like it is, a, the author came from the NIH, or they funded it. And there we treat them like a funder. So they, they may not have been mentioned at all uh, in the affiliation section, but somewhere in the acknowledgement section, or because of the work that digital science does with funders, we know that that was funded by the NIH, for example, we will be able to tell you, uh, you can now filter uh, by uh, that um, particular funder. So there are, for the kind of search that I've done, um, uh, 294 mentions uh, to the uh, outputs that have uh, been tracked there, for example. So uh, there are a lot of different institutions out there. And if you do feel like wanting to interrogate these data, use it a little bit, feel free. There is a downloadable version of the grid database. But if they are in there, uh, they will they will show up here as well. Um, so yeah, fairly uh, fairly broad, I would say, in terms of that. Just out of interest, let's have a look. National Institutes of Health as an affiliation. I wonder if they do um, actually publish as well. I'm sure they do, perhaps. Yep, lots. <laughs> so you can see the NIH, when it comes to uh, funding, they actually, because they are, of course, that, that's a funder group name, their real funding is distributed by the, the lower order funders that sit inside the NIH. Uh, if you want to see some real data, have a look for the NIH as an affiliation. Wonderful. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm part of a hospital with some research output, is what the question says, but I'm not, I, I don't know whether, ah, that, sorry, that's probably a follow on from the same question I was just answering. Um, yeah, so that is a good point. So we do track the university hospitals separately. Uh, for example, just so I can find some examples, uh, university hospital. So, for example, the um, Bonn University Hospital of Brno or Ulm, these are all German ones, but you can see there are 7,300 others. You can, for example, uh, I'm wondering if, yeah, there is, um, Erasmus has a medical center. Um, so I'd imagine it probably will show up more as a, uh, with those terms. So Erasmus Medical, there it is, University Medical Center. So we do track them independently. Um, with this one, either I've got some very strange filter on at the moment, I may do actually. Uh, yeah, I may have some a strange filter on because there is some attention for that. Um, so we do uh, have those show up separately. Um, you can differentiate between Free University Amsterdam and Free University Amsterdam Medical Center, for example, and you can add them together. So you could say, uh, I would like to see the attention for, um, what is it? I think it's VU University. Yeah, and there's the medical, there's both of them. So if I wanted them both, I just type it in again and then choose the uh, medical center the second time, it will add those together. So it is and, not or, uh, that we're running. And I would simply say, yes, I want those, please. And I'd like to uh, have a look at all of the uh, data that's there. For some reason, there is something strange going on. I may have to log out and back in again. Oh no, there we go, it's 381,000 uh, items, so that was working. Um, so yeah, we do differentiate. If you need to do separate reporting for each one, you can do, um, because those are legitimately separate affiliations. Um, you can uh, do that, that kind of um, uh, reporting. Um, the rule is, if it has existed as an affiliation somewhere, and as long as the, um, the center you are in or the, the, the institution you're interested in essentially has a, a website, it can be defined as a separate institution, you should find them in that database. Um, we launched GRID, um, I don't know, about two years ago, and it started with sort of 89,000 institutions. So we've added another 10,000 in just that year and a half um, from mostly either new institutions showing up or refinements to our database where we have separated out um, institutions that are uh, related or sister organizations. Or, or child organizations um, and have then structured them so that uh, you can sort of uh, navigate them. Um, so for example, if we were to look at um, very large, like Pfizer, for example, if we were to go to, to Pfizer again, 
and spell it right this time. What have I broken? I must have spelled something strange. No, nope. okay, let's get back to the beginning. So for example, University of Toronto, uh, they will have many, many related institutes. These are ones that are commonly uh, working with them. They are the sort of partner institutes. And then there are ones that actually belong fully to that institution as sort of a sub-organization. Um, so those are structured that way as well. You can navigate between the two, including where they are and all of these data. And that actually helps us uh, then do the affiliation matching in the Altmetric Explorer. So you can sort of uh, see a little bit more about uh, sort of what is going on. Wonderful. I think with that, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, oh, hang on, there might be one more. So uh, there's another question here. So if we can find out our organization in grid, does that mean we will have detailed or metric information? Uh, uh, most likely, yes. Uh, now it could be that you're in grid and that, that no one has ever spoken about your research. It's very unlikely. It's, so it's not a guarantee, uh, but um, if you aren't from an institution that has something like a research repository or a current research information system, but you still want to see what, to a, a degree of sort of high 90% is correct, what your data are, we would already have it for you. Most likely you would do what our customers do, which is connect your repository to um, our uh, old metric system, and then you would be able to see, for example, your departments, your authors. That's much more reliable um, because it would be an exact reflection of what you know to be yours, and it would be structured the way that you internally know that your data is structured. We can't do any of that internal structuring if we're just looking for affiliations um, in papers and all the rest of it. But what you can do is you can compare your data to any other organization in those 90, almost 97,000 institutions that are there. Um, so you can certainly do that. But if you're interested in, I, I need to see my departments, my groups, um, perhaps my awards, it depends. Some people uh, combine their publications together by particular research activity codes, and they have those internally somewhere. If you can give us access to those, we can then group the explorer's attention that we have to those publications according to how you would expect to see them. So that is always available to anybody. Um, we, we can always reflect, even like, like I say, using an Excel spreadsheet, uh, how that's done. That ultimately will benefit your researchers more as well, because that's what they're expecting to see as well. Uh, last question, and it is a good question. Are trials an option for institutions? Absolutely, we are very generous with our trial times, um, especially for academic institutions that want to uh, get a sense of what the system can do. They want to see what was said about them just yesterday. Um, we run um, uh, trainings for them, and then we will happily uh, give you a time frame when you can uh, log in and use the service um, so you can get a sense of what it looks like. We don't implement your structure uh, during a trial because that would cost us as much as it does to actually implement a full customer. Um, but you would be able to see what I showed you today. So you would see a dummy instance of an institution. So you would get a sense of how you can create alerts. You could even build reports as well based on uh, your uh, sort of attention. Uh, you could go and have a look at what's been said about a rival institution or a collaborating, a collaborating institution out there. All that data, are real, th those data are real. It's the real database. But when it comes to just, uh, you know, your departmental structure, your author names, for example, those would be something that would only be in the real instance. Uh, but they behave exactly the same way as the dummy data that we would give you. They're simply just invented department names and invented author names, but it's all real publications. So if you are interested, do uh, drop um, uh, me a line and I'll put you in touch with the right uh, person uh, to take uh, you through that. Um, you did ask if pricing is in US dollars. We actually offer pricing in many different currencies. Pounds, euros, dollars are the most common. Um, so feel free to ask for a quotation. We can happily do one for you as well. Um, and one, I ended up on a rather salesy note there. I don't normally do that. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much uh, for your time today. And uh, yep, get in touch if you do want to try out the service. It's always available. Um, and we are always on the road as well. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll catch a couple of us uh, showing some of the sort of studies that we do. We have a, a research data team that actually goes and studies things like how has open access contributed to the dis dissemination of science 
uh, or research out there um, is that you know can we do gender guessing to, to work out sort of research disparity in certain areas you know does old metric attention track with you know um, a, a sort of gender conflicts within certain areas they do tend to take an academic view of things rather than just sit you down and talk to you about a product <laughs> like I did today um, wonderful have a, a jolly good rest of the day everybody thank you again for your time and uh, I hope uh, uh, the rest of the week treats you well